So, uh, in this lecture, we will learn about plane strain fracture toughness procedure, which is uh, according to ASTM is defined in the standard E399. Usually, these standards are updated based on the recent information and that is why you will always get some number after this. So, it could be 13A representing that it is uh, it was modified in 2013 and A, B, C all those kind of things can be different nomenclature. But the relevant part is this which never changes. So, for instance E399 whatever is the number behind this will always be describing the ASTM standard for plane strain fracture toughness testing. So, that from this you will get the parameter K1C. If you are doing the testing in mode 2, then you have K2C and in mode 3 you will have K3C. You can also do it in mixed mode, but the plane strain fracture toughness which is the material property is usually K1C. So, the testing is similar to how we perform tensile testing. So, the machine is basically same. What happens is that the grip changes and the grip will be so that it will. So, if you remember the di diagram for the CT specimen which was compact tension specimen. So, in that case you will have a crack tip like this and the specimen will look like this and you will have through holes and you fix a pin inside this and this pin will have a diameter which will be equal to the diameter of the hole you have with the tolerance uh, a little lower so that the pin can go inside. So, it should not get uh, stuck inside. So, you have to give a little bit of clearance so that the pin is not getting stuck and these are some practical information which people do not know for the first time when they are doing testing. So, it is important to uh, provide some amount of clearance, but not too much. Okay? So, you cannot you should not put a pin which is much smaller in diameter to the hole because then that will not be in contact with the whole surface of the hole and therefore, it will be applying local deformation. Okay? So, if you have hole like this and you put a pin which is of this diameter. So, you see that it will only be in contact with some portion of the hole and not all of it. It is not important for the pin to have uh, all contact because you will be pulling the pin in the up direction and therefore, it I, I think it is enough to have contact with the upper half of the pin of the whole surface. So, you put the pin and then you have another. So, that is where the grip comes from. So, you have a grip here which will be something like this and and that grip will also have a hole which will give a clearance so that the pin can go in that also and similarly you will have a grip you will have the another pair of this on the lower side. So, so that will be something like this in which you will have a hole again and this will have another part which will be going on the other side and this will be perpendicular. So, if I just draw the grip uh, isolated, then the grip will look like this. So, you have a hole here and then you have another side of it where you have another hole. and the other side may not be visible, but this will go like this 
and then the upper part has to be fixed with the machine so you have a bigger hole here which so this it, it may look like this and then with a with another pin you fix it with the machine okay so this is only the upper part and then of course you have the exact opposite of this on the lower side so these are called clevis okay these are the part which hold the the sample the specimen and this kind of uh, fixture you will uh, you will need only for compact tension type of a specimen so for ct specimen for uh, three point bend specimen or single edge notched bending specimen you will need a different kind of fixture so you put so basically the machine is same you only have this clevis part which is different and then you put the specimen which looks like this but before putting the specimen the important part of fracture toughness is that the theory was uh, so english described his theory on elliptical cracks or circular cracks which looks like this and he had a finite root radius which we used in in the equation if you remember which was rho which was equal to b square by a where b is the minor axis a is the major axis of the ellipsoid half minor axis and half major axis so apart from english when you come to uh, the theory of westergaard and williams and irwin where we discovered this stress relationship with the stress intensity factor and the position there the assumption is the is that the crack is very very sharp so this this root radius is not finite there so the crack has to be very sharp okay it 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 is so sharp that it should not be the two surfaces uh, are actually in contact so in order to make a very sharp crack it is not possible to make it by uh, by using manufacturing tools so this kind of notch you can make by broaching machine so you can take a rectangular piece of specimen which looks like this okay and then what you do is you uh, you put it in the broaching machine and that broaching machine will have a tool which will be in the shape of v notch and that will cut the material or remove the material from here and you will get this kind of notch okay but you cannot make so this notch will have some amount of root radius okay some amount of a uh, circular thing at the tip which is called the root radius depending upon the tool because tool is so if you are using some kind of trigonal tool this tool is not very sharp at the tip because you have made it somewhere and you cannot make uh, something very sharp so the other possibility is to is to do a uh, wire edm so you can cut it with a wire edm machine but then the problem is you so the smallest dimension of wire which you can use for cutting usually is 0.25 mm so if you are cutting with this wire then even then you will be putting at least you will be going through the wire at least once here and therefore you will have a root radius of 0.25 mm which is the radius of the wire so you cannot make a crack sharper than this by using conventional machining tools so what we do in fracture mechanics is that we apply some amount of fatigue loading why do we do fatigue loading why not we just uh, put it in the machine and pull it so that there is a crack because fatigue uh, loading can cause a crack to propagate when the stresses are smaller than yield strength okay and this should be very um, astonishing to you because we usually think so far uh, that the deformation in the material happens once we cross the yield strength if we are in the elastic zone if we are in the elastic part of the deformation 
we cannot have a permanent deformation and therefore how can we propagate the crack. But in fatigue loading, in cyclic loading it is possible and we will deal with this in detail when we talk about cyclic loading or when we talk about fatigue deformation. But just to inform you at this point of time is that we make a sharp crack by doing a fatigue pre-cracking. It is called pre-cracking because the real cracking will be done in the fracture toughness testing and before that we make a sharp crack and that is why it is called pre-crack. So this sharp part is made by fatigue pre-cracking and we control it so that the stress is never going beyond the yield strength. Apart from that we also see, we also do it in a controlled manner so that the crack length is according to our will. So we have discussed in the last lecture that the fracture toughness will be a function of how deep your crack is. So if the crack is this deep or that deep, it will change according to that. So therefore we want to fix the things, we want to have let us say the initial crack length and the width of the specimen to have a ratio of 0.5. So we make, so for example if we are taking a specimen. Uh, let us say this is our specimen and we take this dimension as 20 mm. Okay. We want to have this ratio is equal to 0.5 mm. So how much should be the crack length? Crack length should be 10 mm. right? In order to have a crack length of 10 mm, we will make a notch which will be only 8 mm okay? and rest 2 mm we will do by fatigue pre-cracking. And we will do it in such a way that when it is reaching 2 mm, we can stop the machine and we have our initial crack. Although again it cannot be exactly 10 mm, so it will be 9.6, 9.7 mm or 10.1 mm. So those values are fine. So we get a sharp crack and we also do it in a controlled manner by fatigue pre-cracking. And once we are done with this sharp cracking, then our real test starts and we will start with that in the next page. So, so when we do, when we put the specimen after pre-cracking, fix it in the clevis and start the machine like tensile test. So once we have put the specimen, so let me draw that part again. So we have this specimen in the machine. So we have fixed this in the machine. And then we have a sharp crack also and we have the pins and we have loaded that in the machine like this and I am just drawing the schematic. So this is fixed in the machine, this part and then the upper part is also fixed in the machine and then we pull the upper part up and this part does not move so this part is fixed okay so the upper part is moving now again similar to tensile testing we will be having force from the machine coming up from the load cell okay so we will be getting the value of the force and we can get the displacement values also from the frame. So this frame is moving and that machine knows because machine knows how its parts are moving. So machine will give you the displacement of this, uh, the frame of the machine. So which is called actuator displacement or axial displacement. So you will get that part of the displacement without any, any problem. So that axial displacement you will get from the machine. That is not a problem as long as we are dealing with very brittle material. But it is a problem when there is, there is some ductility in the material because there will be some plastic deformation and that plastic deformation will be different here. Usually plastic deformation will happen at the crack tip and not in the remote areas. Okay. So the displacement which is realized by the machine is exactly not the displacement which is felt at the crack tip. Okay? So there are some differences and that is why you put, so like in tensile specimen we used to put a, an extensometer 
which will uh, tell you the exact strain at the diameter. In this case, we put something which fixes its jaw at, at these locations and then again you have the parts here which join together and there is a wire which goes in the machine and you get the signal from this machine which has a calibration with the displacement. So, so this device looks like this where you have two clips. Okay. So, there are two clips the upper clip and the lower clip will be joining at the two ends of this notch and as it opens up okay, because when you pull this the, the notch will be opening up and so these clips will also be relaxed. So, when these clips are not attached to the machine they can actually go open up to certain extent which is called which is fixed for the device. Then you compress it and put it in the machine and so when you when this specimen is opened up then these clip, clips are also opening up. So, as they open up there are uh, resistances on the clip. So, there is a wheatstone bridge kind of structure which can give different signal depending upon how much uh, these clips are apart from each other how much they have opened up. So, because uh, that opening up will be causing some uh, strain in this clip itself which will be calculated in the form of electrical signal, signal and that signal will go in the machine. So, this device is called COD gauge. Of course, you will have to use different gauges if you are performing at different temperatures. So, from this device you can also get the displacement which is simply called the COD. COD means clip on device and it can also mean crack opening displacement. So, when we talk about device then it is clip on device or simply clip on gauge, but it is also called COD gauge with the real meaning that crack opening displacement gauge. Okay. So, you get this value also which you can use as the displacement value for your calculation. So, basically from the test you get force and displacement. It can be axial displacement, it can be COD displacement, COD displacement is more accurate. So, if you have that facility you want to use that, uh, that displacement value. If the material is very brittle then you can and if you are doing the testing in three point bending then you can still go on with the axial displacement values and you do not need this device in that case. So, once you have force displacement then depending upon what kind of material it is you will be having different types of plots. So, if you plot force versus displacement there are basically three categories of the force displacement curves which you get type 1 kind of plot looks very similar to what we see in the stress strain curve. So, it looks like this. So, initially you have a linear part and then you have a non-linear part. This linear part again will have some non-linearity here which you have to take care of as we did this in one of the tutorial with the tensile test data. You should also do zero correction in this data also. So, that part is taken care of and after that you have this linear part and then you have non-linear part. So, once you get this force this kind of curve is called type 1 curve and in this case we have to find out a specific value of force which we will be calling P q. Using this P q we will be calculating our stress intensity factor. Okay. So, we have to decide what should be the right value of the force which we should use for calculating stress intensity factor. And that depends upon if the material is brittle or ductile. Why? Because if the material is very ductile then this plane strain fracture toughness testing is not valid because it is assumed that the plasticity is very small only then our theory of Irwin 
that means that equation is valid only when the plasticity is confined it is very small. So, that is why we want to have plane strain condition and too much constraint so that the plastic zone is not very big plasticity is confined and only then our test is valid. In order to check that and this kind of curve is usually found in rel relatively ductile materials. So, what we want to do is we want to check if the material is very ductile to have a valid value of fracture toughness or it is ok so that we can still use this data and find out this the critical stress intensity factor which will be our plane strain fracture toughness ok. So, the ASTM standard procedure says that first of all you measure the slope the initial slope ok. So, you will have a initial line which from which so you take this data and this data you do a linear fit find out the slope and draw a line and that line will be this then you find out a slope which is 5 percent lower than this ok. So, for example, you found the slope to be let us say 20,000 and now you decrease it by 5 percent and then you plot another line with that with that uh, uh, with 95 percent of this as the slope that will be very close to the initial line because that will be only 5 percent down. But to show the analysis part I will be drawing it at a certain distance. So, let us say that this is the line which you get if I decrease the slope by 5 percent. So, this line is called 5 percent secant line ok. So, you drop the slope by 5 percent and you draw this line and you find out the intersection ok this intersection let us name this intersection as P s value. This intersection is P s value then so, let us say that this value is 8 kilo Newton. Now, you want to find out 80 percent of this P s value. So, 80 percent of that P s value you have to find out. So, if this is here then 80 percent let us say is somewhere here ok. So, this is 0.8 of P s. So, that will be 6.4 kilo Newton which is somewhere here and that horizontal line is cutting the initial uh, our force displacement curve at this point of time right. Now, let me draw this region in a magnified view so that we can understand about further analysis. So, what we have is that we have initial line with the initial slope and then we have this uh, actual curve of our force displacement data. Then we have drawn another line which is at 5 percent lower uh, slope and therefore, this point is our P s point. Then at 80 percent of this value I have so this is 0.8 ps and this cuts here ok. Now, this distance this distance is let us say x 1 ok and this distance is this distance is x s because it is corresponding to p s. So, what is this distance? This distance is the load which you have found from the 5 percent secant line intersection with the initial slope intersection ok. So, that distance is x s and at 80 percent you get a value x 1 and then the standard says that if this x 1 is greater than 1 fourth of x s then your material is too ductile. Okay. This is a way of judging how much non-linearity is changing per 20 percent change in the force. Okay. So, with change in force if the if the displacement is changing too much then the material is too ductile 
and you have to set certain threshold and therefore that threshold is at 25 percent. So, if x 1 is greater than x s by 4, then the material is too ductile and your test is invalid. Okay? So, the material which you made, this, the specimen you made, you invested some time in pre-cracking, all that has gone waste because this data you cannot use to find out plane strain fracture toughness. So, if this happens, your test is invalid. If this does not happen, meaning that if it is less than equal to x s by 4, your data is good, you can use this data for measuring the plane strain fracture toughness. And in this case, when this is valid, then you say that this P s value is your P q value. P q value was the one which we will be using in our fracture toughness analysis. Okay? So, we will find out what P q is, then at the end we will, I will tell you how to calculate K 1 C from P q. Okay? So, so far for type 1 curve, it should be clear that what should be the value of P q. In the next page, we will uh, see uh, about type 2 curve and then type 3 curve which uh, are also found when we do this kind of testing. So, type 2 curve, in this case we have, so the curve looks like this. So, we are drawing force versus displacement. So, force is in usually is in Newton and displacement is in millimeters, but of course, that is the case with metallic materials. If we are doing, if we are testing something else, then the dimensions might change, but then again for plane strain fracture toughness, we want to have brittle materials and therefore, usually we will be testing either glass or metallic materials which are very brittle. So, unless we want to test the fracture toughness of chocolate at lower temperature, we will be using metallic materials. So, type 2 kind of curve looks like this. So, again it has a linear part, then it goes sorry, then it goes up like this and then there is a sudden drop in the force and it again catches up, it again goes up. Of course, it will never cross the maximum force. Okay? So, it will be non-linear again. This phenomena where there is a sudden drop is called pop in phenomena. This happens because there is a sudden uh, crack propagation. So, uh, it is like uh, yeah, like breaking a chocolate. So, you put the chocolate in, in between your fingers and then you press it from behind. So, that is actually three point bending. Okay? So, if I hold the chocolate like this and then I press it from behind. So, you see this is like a three point bending test. So, then you hear a sound suddenly and similar sound you can hear while testing metallic materials also. And as the crack propagates, so the crack is here and then the crack suddenly propagated. Uh, so, this sudden propagation, this high velocity crack growth causes even low velocity crack growth will cause the load to decrease. Why it will cause the load to decrease? The answer is this. It is very simple that the material which is holding the continuum, in this case let us say if this is 20 and my crack length is 10, then this distance which is called the ligament length is 10 mm. right? So, 10 mm material is intact, that 10 mm has not broken yet. Once the crack propagates, let us say by 2 mm, then the remaining part is only 8 mm and therefore, the intact material area has decreased from 10 mm to 8 mm. 
and therefore because less material is holding the continuum you will need lower load to deform that and that is why the load decreases. As the crack will grow further the load will keep on decreasing. So, usually initially the crack in the, the force increases it increases because there is no crack growth as soon as crack growth starts the load will be decreasing. Okay? So, this sudden crack propagation causes this load drop and then there is no sudden propagation. So, there is slow crack propagation and that will require some uh, load again. So, therefore, it will increase to certain extent and then it will go on and once crack starts growing further then it will be decreasing like this. But we do not have to go till that point we are done here and as long as this kind of so, if we have this kind of curve, what should be the value of PQ? That is the question. How do we find out? So, in this case, ASTM standard says that the everything uh, what we did in type 1 remains the same except that we take PS as the maximum load. P max is the PS. We do not take at 5 percent secant line we take this maximum value which is P max to be equal to P s. Okay? Then we of course, have to draw the secant line, we do have to draw the secant line that is required. Okay? So, this line is, is at 5 percent lower slope. Why do we have to do it? Because that criteria of ductility checking is still there. Only difference is in type 1 we took this as P s, in type 2 we will take P max as P s. So, that is my P s point, we take now I take 80 percent of that P max which will be somewhere down the line. Okay? So, let us say that 80 percent is somewhere there and then I draw a line like this and it intersects the line here, the 5 percent secant line okay? there. And then I have to find out, so initial line is this and final line is that. So, actually it is going uh, in a different direction because I have drawn the 5 percent secant line 2 away exaggerated. So, usually it will be somewhere, so 80 percent is here, so here, so let me magnify this plot so that it is clear. So, this is my initial slope line, then I have the, the experimental part where the load goes to a maximum value then it drops okay? and here it is it's the linear line. So, this is my P s which is my P max also. right? Then of course, I have the 5 percent secant line. So, that 5 percent secant line is somewhere here. Okay? So, this is my 5 percent secant line. Then I drop the load to let us say 80 percent and 80 percent let us say is here. Okay? So, I draw a line. So, 80 percent I go down that load is here. So, then I draw a line okay? and this line intersects the original curve here. right? So, in this case again my distance this distance is x 1 and this distance is x s. And again I will have to check if x 1 is greater than x s by 4 or not. If it is greater than by, by x 4, x s by 4, then the material is ductile, I cannot use the data. Otherwise, I will take p max as p q and I have a valid p q value using which I will be calculating my pressure toughness. Right? So, now for type 2 we have p q value, then I can have another type of curve which is called type 3 and this kind of curve is obtained in a very very brittle material. Okay? So, type 1 was for a relatively ductile material, type 2 is somewhere moderate, the material is brittle, but not very brittle. Very brittle material will behave in this way. So, if you draw the force displacement curve for a very brittle material, 
then it will increase the load will reach a maximum and then suddenly you have crack propagation very fast. So, it straight away goes down without any uh, cover up without any going up again. So, this initial crack propagation will lead to a catastrophic failure. So, the crack will not stop the material will not resist the crack to stop. So, in that case the, this thing goes down and this is called elastic brittle or very very brittle material this kind of curve you will see in glasses also in steels you can see this kind of curve at a very low temperature. This example is uh, is for understanding. So, in reality this curve can be very small ok. So, the displacement will not be so long, but if I draw a curve like this then you you it, it is not possible to explain everything there. So, that is why we have exaggerated the curves so that you can understand how the analysis is going ok. So, in type 3 you use the same procedure what we used in type 2 we will take p q as p max ok. We will draw the, the secant line we you can do this analysis, but it is eventual that in this kind of curve you will always have x 1 less than x s less than equal to x s by 4 and therefore, it will always be a plane strain thing. It is in the plane strain because the material is very very brittle ok. So, you can use so you the chances of having invalid test in this kind of uh, curve is very very small. Now, once you have the p q value you can calculate the fracture toughness and that fracture toughness we will call k q ok. We will call k q and not k 1 c because there is another criteria which we will have to fulfill in order to assign that this k q is the fracture toughness ok. One check of ductility we have done, we need to do another check of ductility uh, which we will see in the next page. So, we have got k q value, how do we get k q value because we have p q values right. So, now this thing will change for different type. So, the geometry effect will come. So, k q for a C T specimen compact tension specimen can be calculated by this formula. So, you use p q value divided by b into w to the power 1 by 2. So, root of w and f of a by w where f of a by w is a function of the ratio of the crack depth right. So, we know what k q is, we know what b p q is, we need to know what these symbols are and that comes from the standard geometry of the sample. So, instead of drawing it in 3 d I will be drawing it in 2 d ok for the sake of simplicity and understanding. And let me also do it in a in a nice way. So, the hole is drilled in such a way that the center of the hole always is aligned with the initial crack tip ok. And I forgot to draw the fatigue pre crack part. So, let us let me make it there. So, that is my sharp crack. So, that tip is aligned with the with the initial uh, so center of the circle ok. Now, what is my crack length? My crack length sorry I made a big mistake while explaining the geometry of the specimen uh, even in the previous part of the lecture. So, the hole is not aligned with the crack tip, the hole is at a defined distance from this surface ok. So, forget about this diagram and let me draw it again. So, the specimen diagram or the sketch will look like this usually and we will have a sharp crack here and then 
you may find different types of design you can have a uh, different design here also but this part will be same okay and then i have holes here and these holes have certain distances fixed so it has to be some ratio some distance defined distance from the upper surface then defined distance from this point okay so now imagine that the centers are there and let me draw a line which is joining the center of these two holes okay and this is my tip so this distance is called the crack length a okay not from here but from this line is called load line okay so from this point to the crack tip that distance is my crack length remaining distance is my ligament length which is denoted as b not because it is the initial ligament length as the crack will be growing this value will be changing so it is also called a not but when we are talking about brittle fracture it can be just a and b because we don't uh, calculate the the these values at different crack lengths in one specimen that we will come at a later point when we discuss how we uh, calculate the fracture toughness of ductile material so for now we can just take that this is the value of the crack length this is the value of the ligament length this distance this total distance is denoted as capital w meaning that it is the width of the specimen okay then this distance is usually 1.2 w and this distance is usually 1.25 w but that is not important important are these parameters in which now we know what w is and now we know what a is a is the crack length w capital w is the width of the specimen and if you see this w will be equal to a plus b right crack length plus ligament length is the width of the specimen which is very clear apart from that there is a thickness dimension right that thickness is denoted as b capital b so capital b is the thickness of the specimen okay so now you know how to calculate kq from pq so pq divided by b into root over w into f of a by w will be giving you the value of kq for ct specimen for compact tension specimen okay f of a by w is is a function which i can provide but it is not important to learn that function or memorize that function it is important to understand that this function has different value for different types of specimen so for ct specimen for instance the function looks like this 29.6 into a by w to the power half minus 185.5 a by w to the power 3 by 2 so 1.5 plus 655.7 into a by w to the power 5 by 2 minus 1017 point a by w to the power 7 by 2 plus 638.9 into a by w to the power 9 by 2 this is a polynomial of course and it is not required to remember but it is important to know that this function these poly, this polynomial will be different for different types of specimen so for ct specimen we find that the function is this this function is required because depending upon how deep the crack is that's that is what is defined by the ratio a by w right so how long is a in comparison to the width of the specimen 
So, if you start with a different A by W ratio, then this k q is dependent on that value and therefore, we need to address this in the formulation. So, that we can get a value which is independent right. So, if somebody does a test with a different A by W ratio, he should be able to get the same value of k in comparison to what we got at different A by W ok. So, that is why this function is there. Now, this formula changes totally this formula will be completely different for different type of specimen because of the geometry effect ok. This is the effect coming because of the crack depth formula will be changing because of the effect of. So, for uh, SE and B, so now we have discussed about CT type of specimen right. Now, the things will be same type 1, type 2, type 3 curve will be same, but the formula will change if we are doing the testing in uh, for single edge notched bend specimen or S E N B type of specimen. So, this type of specimen will be loaded in this way. The machine upper part will have certain kind of fixture and here you will you might have a roller pin or just the, the machine itself can be uh, can be having a root radius here ok. So, this is the upper part and then you have rectangular bar. So, this S E and B type of specimen is like this. Okay, and then you have a notch here. So, exactly, so this should be in perfect alignment with the crack and it is there and then you have a fatigue free crack. Okay. So, a, a sharp crack is there and the lower part of the machine will be having. So, rollers there and then you have rollers here. Okay. So, so these are also in three dimension So, the lower part looks like this ok. So, this is the lower part of the machine that is the upper part of the machine and you are pushing it down ok and the machine will be pushing the the specimen in three point bending which is as I told you it is like this. So, I push it from my thumb ok and the two fingers they act like these two points and the thumb acts like this and you just try to break it ok. So, this is three point bending. In this case uh, this so we have other dimensions. So, this dimension is my thickness of the specimen which is B right this dimension is my w. So, width of the specimen. Then you know what is the crack length? Crack length is this dimension. So, this is my crack length a. The remaining part is the ligament length which is my small b right. And this distance which is the distance between the two pin points on the down side is called the span of the specimen. So, these dimensions are the same dimension for three point bending test when you do not have a crack also, but in fracture toughness we do have a crack and we do the test in three point bending. So, it is called three point bending test also in this case, but better word is single edge notched bend specimen. The important thing is this bending is in three point bending not four point bending. So, this length is called the span length and in this case we have the value of P q if we have the value of p q, we get the value of k q as equal to p q span length divided by the thickness of the specimen w which is the width of the specimen to the power 3 by 2 into f of a by w. Remember this f of a by w is not the same value as c t specimen this f of a by w is different ok. I will not be writing the whole polynomial, but you have to understand that this function is different from that function and the difference is because the specimen geometry is different the type of loading is different instead of tension we are applying bending 
okay. So, from P Q rest of the values we already have because we have vernier calipers from which you can measure the dimensions. So, of course, you have the span length, you have the thickness of the specimen, you have the width of the specimen, you have the crack length of the specimen. So, you have all the values from which you can calculate K Q. Now, you have K Q the question is, is this the fracture toughness value or not? According to the standard, they made it sure that the plastic zone radius is very small. Okay. How do we get that? So, let us imagine that the plastic zone radius is Rp. Okay. Uh, you have to put a threshold value. So, what you say is that I want my specimen to be so big that my plastic zone radius. So, the smallest dimension of my specimen is at least 50 times higher than the plastic zone radius which it will be forming. Okay. So, what should be the maximum plastic zone radius which can form during the testing? The maximum, so we know the formula for plastic zone radius which was given by Irwin. In plane strain condition it is 1 by 6 pi k 1 c by sigma naught whole square. Right? k by sigma naught whole square, the maximum plastic zone will be forming at the value of the critical stress intensity factor right because you are not going more than that. So, you calculate the plastic zone radius by using k 1 c. Now, there is the problem because k 1 c is not known that is why you are doing the test because you want to know what is the value of k 1 c right. So, this k q value is a suspected k 1 c put this value here you get the plastic zone radius rp right 50 times of that rp will be how much 50 into 1 by 6 pi into k 1 c by sigma naught whole square right you want your lowest dimension to be bigger than this what is the lowest dimension or smallest dimension or specimen either the thickness or the crack length usually these two are the smallest dimension and these two should be greater than equal to 50 times of the of the plastic zone ok. So, this criteria in the standard has come in this form 2.5 k 1 c by sigma naught whole square ok. So, if you do the calculation how much it is. So, this is you can take it as 50 divided by 18 approximately right. So, this is close to 2.5. So, that is how this criteria has come and you want to have a rounded off figure you do not want to have 2.45763 into k 1 c by sigma naught whole square. So, you give a value of 2.5 and you want to be sure that the plastic zone radius is at least 50 times smaller than the smallest dimension of the specimen to ensure that you put this criteria. So, you calculate k q using this formula or the previous one depending upon what kind of specimen you have tested. Take that k q value here and check if the thickness is smaller than this value or not ok. So, for example, you got a value of k q which is equal to 100 mega Pascal root, root meter ok. So, you use that value and let us say the, the yield strength is 200 mega Pascal ok. And you have done a testing on a 10 mm thick specimen. So, B was 10 mm ok. So, now what is the value of the right hand side? Right hand side is 2.5 into k 1 c is 100 divided by 200 to the square. So, that is equal to 1 by 2. So, 2 point. So, that is equal to 2.5 divided by 4 right. So, this is how much and this will be in meter. So, multiply it by 1000 to get it in millimeters ok. So, this will be 25 divided by 40 into 1000. So, it will be approximately 6 let us take that as 6 and then you will have uh, 6.2 ok. So, take it 6.2 into 100. So, 62 into 10 so 620 millimeters ok. So, the thickness 
should be 620 millimeters at least, but you have tested a specimen which is only 10 millimeter thick. Okay? This sounds very big and usually it is very big, but let me just check. So, 6.2 into 10 will be 62 and 620. Yeah. So, we have tested a very small specimen and you see, you probably can see the problem with this kind of testing. The problem is that you need a very, very thick specimen to do a valid uh, plain strain factor toughness testing. We will come to this problem at a later point of time. So, in the next lecture, but at this point of time, you must realize that once you have kq, you calculate this value and you must check if, if the thickness of, of the crack length, both of them must be greater than what you calculated from this. So, it should be greater than 620 mm. If it is greater than 620 mm, then your test is valid and then you can call your kq as plane strain fracture toughness in mode 1. Okay. So, we conclude the chapter here, this lecture and we will start uh, with this problem of using a very high thickness uh, specimens for measuring plane strain fracture toughness. That will be our starting point in the next lecture. Okay. Thank you.